Mm -hmm. Are you guys seeing the, the presentation now? I think so. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, as I was saying, this has a lot to do with, with the topic of my last presentation with you guys, um, especially the part relating to the concept of interaction and the concept of concrete universal. So let's begin. I will read this as fast as I can. Um, my, my English is bad speaking, but it's worse when I read. So bear with me. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yeah, let's begin. Um, modern materialism started in England as nominalism. No surprise there. Since Plato and the realism of the Middle Ages, the reality of the universals was taken mostly in the spirit of objective idealism as ideal forms existing outside and independently of the individual's head. Apparently, the only materialist approach to the universal is to conceive it, to conceive it in terms of an abstracted similarity among individuals fixed as a class with the help of a general term. Similarly, a teleological account of nature will seem today an anachronism, if not a very scandalous teleological crime from the point of view of materialism. It will, it will imply finding nature's orders to be the result of intelligent design, the, the execution of an ideal plan or purpose, a sign of providence. Materialist science, it seems, should see nature as a blind mechanism, a strip of meaning and intentionality in which nothing happens in pursuit of an end. Both conceptions of the objectivity of universal's forms and the teleological disposition of nature seem to be doomed to rest in peace in the garbage can of philosophy's history. At the same time, a non-dialectical materialism, a critically accept idealism duality of the active form as a, the ideal principle and the passive matter as the mere substratum deprived of determination or, or self-development. This approach is typical of those who dismiss Engels' dialectics of nature as a step back towards the enchanted idealist conception of nature. In principle, the idealists believe that form, the active principle, is a product of consciousness, only now understood not as a cosmic subject, as in Hegel, but as a social one, is what led the John Lukács to place dialectics only in the relation of subject and object. From there, virtually all the exponents of Western Marxism claimed that naturalistic, a naturalistic account of matter was incompatible with dialectics. Nature, supposedly, lacks any immanent principle of activity, and those who suggest otherwise can only be assuming a pantheistic teleological position. This view led Althusser to embrace his abstract materialism of the reign of the aleatory encounter. The only materialist alternative to idealism, say Althusser, is empiricism, atomistic nominalism. No ontological status is granted to universal forms and finality, meanwhile, unconditioned contingent causality among individuals is posed as matter's sole mode of existence. Is this nominalist and mechanistic picture of nature the final word of materialism? Well, Ilyenkov identified two different and even opposite fundamental conceptions of, universal, of the universal at play in the history of philosophy. 
the first understands the universal as the common law of existence that unify the diversity of phenomena as a system, an objective totality. This conception was shared by practically all the pre-Socratic materialists who saw in this unity, in this principle, um, different kinds of arche, although under the form of idealism, that was also the view of Plato's theory of forms. This tradition flows into both Hegel and Marx philosophies. The second basic conception of the universal's nature consists of the abstract identity of phenomena sharing common traits under a class, a class, kind, or genus. Thus, only individuals have ontological status, according to this view. This conception is present in the Middle Ages nominalist, in the British empiricism of the modern age, and even in contemporary philosophies uh, related to the analytical trend. This second conception, predominant in contemporary common sense as well, has his philosophical roots in Stoicism. Stoics ontology, central, the central statement of their ontology is that only bodies exist. And to them, a body is always a particular thing. So the Stoics consider the universals as a convenient phrase linguistic conveniences or fictions. This view was based on to the medi medieval nominalist who saw language as the sole bearer of universals. However, um, it reached its zenith in British classical empiricism. empiricism. John Locke defined the universal as an invention of the understanding based on the similarity of things or served by the mind. The letter creates an abstract general idea that we evoke using general terms referring to classes of individual objects. So deeply this, um, did this view soak through Anglo-Saxon philosophical traditions that it is um, common that uh, their, their contemporary exponents uncritically identify the universal with the abstract and the concrete with the particular. That's why we're entitled to use the expression abstract universal to refer to this specific interpretation of the universality. Its main feature is the generic identity among individuals achieved by the subjective operation of abstraction. The historical first conception of the universal, however, was quite different. This conception understands the universal not as the outcome of a subjective operation, abstraction, but as the common objective order or logos, principle or arche behind the development of natural phenomena. The search for the one and the same material principle of the unity, unity of nature, great development and variety of phenomena was the main task for pre-Socratic materialism. Despite idealism efforts to hide it, the ancient materialists such as Thales Heraclitus or Democritus tried to find this universal principle not in the realm of pure thought, not from the outside of nature, but within nature, in matter itself. Anaximander Aperon is nothing but the genetic, genetic, undifferentiated material stuff, out of which through its internally contradictory dialectical movement towards pro progressive di differentiation, all the multiplicity of material things come to be. As speculative as Anaximander's doctrine might sound, 
contemporary medical science has found its appearance in a very real material object, namely stem cells. These relatively undifferentiated cells are real particular cells existing next to nervous muscle and blood cells, especially singular cells having a poor resembles, resembles to bone or skin. Yet they have the universal potentiality of becoming, transforming themselves into any other kind of cells forming our tissues like bone, skin, um, and others. Therefore, all our body's cells refer are linked to uh, the embryonic stem cells, not as the generic abstraction, abstraction of their common traits, but as their common ancestor. Here, universality is not merely a generic abstract, but a genetic, commonly uh, concrete union of the parent-child type. The concrete universal is, uh, I mean, this genetic unity by opposition to the abstract universal's form of unity is not accomplished through identity, but through difference, opposition, and specifically through the contradiction. In general, this is true of every organic internal necessary interaction process. Classical Newtonian mechanics conceive interaction among bodies as a more or less causal contingent external event. The, parad the paradigmatic example of this kind of interaction are the balls uh, colliding on a billiard table. The billiard balls put in motion by an external agent meet for a millisecond and say their respective farewells without worrying about their future as billiard balls. They do not need each other. Meanwhile, the development of a concrete totality, say an organism, is carried out through another very different kind of interaction. When a hand say farewell to its arm, that is when it's shut off, it roots, it rots, disappearing, disappears as a hand. Interaction between organs always takes place as contempt, um, complementary, repris, repro, uh, sorry, contem, complementary reciprocity. The heart, the heart needs the lungs precisely because they provide to the blood the, what the former cannot and vice versa. Anyone, can, could tell, anyone could tell the same reflecting on their personal or even romantic relations. Uh, a quote for, for, uh, from Ilyankov now. Two, absolute, two absolutely equal individuals each of which has the very same set of knowledge, habits, inclination, etc., would be absolutely uninteresting to each other. And the, and the one would not need the other. They would simply bore each other to death. It is nothing but a simple doubling, a doubling of solitariness. Sexual end of quote end of quote. Sexual union copulation presupposes two complementary opposites, male and female. But homosexuals also tend to find in their par in their partners what they need, that is, what they lack. Indeed, this dialectical internal interaction between opposed and presupposed lovers is popularly known as chemistry, as chemical attraction. Even pre-Socratic materialism conceived the universal as entirely material relation, an objective form of interaction inherent, 
in natural historical processes. In Plato, this objective universal principle is, tr is translated from the material to the ideal realm, but still, as is well known, this doesn't mean that Plato conceived the universal as a result of a mental operation, nor as a similarity or a mediocre average among the proper properties of individuals. The generic form must be conceived not as a bare abstraction obtained by leaving out all the specific differences determining the subordinate species, but as a whole richer and um, in content uh, that any of the parts it contains and embraces. Indeed, platonic forms being ideal remain concrete. Moreover, they are concrete, real, rich, complex totality precisely because they are truly universal. Such view uh, dismisses the commonsensical identification between material and concrete or controversially abstract and ideal. In this dismissal, Plato, sorry, in this dismissal, Plato is not wrong. In essence, such was the same approach that the idealist Hegel and the materialist Marx and Engels took for addressing concreteness. In this tradition, the concrete is the outcome of the synthesis, union of multiple determinations. Concrete is opposed to abstract in the same way in which complexity is the opposite of simplicity. Complex, the word, derived from the Latin uh, word complexus, means something that is waved together as the threads in a fabric. Similarly, a concrete object is an internal necessary unity of multiple determination which by themselves, that is, in isolation, are abstract. That's why reality is always concrete, not because it's solid or more specific, but because all its phenomena are interconnected like threads in a piece of fabric. It is only through abstraction that we isolate phenomena from their concrete unified totality. The abstract is the outcome of analysis, separation of what comes united. The concrete in thought is the reintegration, unity synthesis of such abstract separate aspects in a concept. The, the reproduction in our thought of the real unity in phenomena, the real unity of phenomena existing outside and independently of it. The concept, the universal in thought, is not an abstract set of traits for some unknown reason repeated in a group, class, set, aggregate of phenomena. It is a totality of internal relations, a concrete totality of determination which with more content than any of its particular instances. That's why Engels like to say that the general law of the change of form of motion is much more concrete than any single concrete, uh, in brackets, uh, example of it. Neither was Plato wrong uh, in insist insisting on the ideal objectivity. For the ideal is not a product of the individual's mind, neither can be explained from the analysis, either psychological or physiological of the individual uh, he head or psyche. Objective idealism 
is nothing but the deification of human activity, particularly of the social activity per excellence, labor. For labor is a purposeful activity that while obeying, uh, obeying uh, nature's laws imprints on nature the form of our, our will. Instead of understanding the idea of forms as human-made objective representations of material universal forms of development, objective idealism since um, sees the, the source of concrete universality in, in nature. Um, this inversion of the ideal uh, of the concepts appears uh, um, there as the prime cause of the ultimate end of material reality. Is nature then an historical reality? With the materialist interpretation of the concrete universal, we already have seen that nature by itself can produce new forms of existence. It moves through processes, temporary standard interactions of becoming, of transformation. But are we entitled to speak of the historical development of nature? Indeed, the question is pertinent. History is not just an arbitrary succession of changes in which formations have no other relationship that the temporary extrinsically connection of before, after, or simultaneously. It implies a relative progression, um, that is a directional process from lower to higher forms of development or stages, if you want. Um, even pre-Socratic materialists conceived their concrete universal as principles of change and the generation of order out of chaos, development and evolution. Today, in general terms, in general terms, we like to think that tribal communities are not just past social formation, but also less developed ones than our current modes of production. The same way, in the same way, we talk about the embryos, the embryo, um, the child development in the mother's womb, the evolution in you know, of the living world, or even of the entire universe. Are there latter? Are those just um, metaphorical expressions? Or is the case that all these are truly historical processes? Idealism teleology sees in all directional processes the persecution of a conscious finality, an aim, a goal, a reason. It is worth noting that our human social lives are shaped in that teleological way. We like to think that all our actions, or at least the ones that matter, have some purpose. This is true of men, not only as an individual, but also and fundamentally as a universal being, as humankind. Labor, the concrete universal activity throughout which humans create their own social world, is a conscious and teleological process in which an ideal plan or design receives its material realization, its product. Therefore, the material product, the outcome of labor, is the being in the order of an ideal, conscious end, plan, or a design that gives direction to the activity. But this is precisely what all materialism must, by principle, deny to external nature, to extra-human nature. Subjective so idealism has projected such a human activity into the extra human realm in the form of a demiurge or um, a god that shapes matter according to external ideal forms. Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, for Engels, a, teleolo a teleological account only means the absence of a proper scientific explanation for natural phenomena and answered problems. In nature, he says, nothing happens as a consciously, consciously desired aim. But if that is Engels' position, why do his uh, detractors accuse him of pantheism and hilosoism? Because he conceives nature as an historical realm of active processes able to create higher, more concrete forms of existence out of simpler interaction forms. From the perspective of objective idealism, the spontaneous transformation from an inferior to a superior state, for example, from inanimate matter to living creatures, seems to be a miraculous, a, um, a miracle, a violation of the famous and nothing comes from nothing principle. For there is nothing in alive, sorry, for there is nothing alive in chemical or physical interaction out of which one can derive, one can extract a bacteria, let alone a human being. Just as there was nothing um, in the water um, uh, out of which Jesus may wine or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Thus, it seems that every higher stage must have been conceived first in the form of a concept. This ideal design ex expresses them itself through the lifeless, lifeless matter, just as the the post, just as the pot form. Sorry, just as the the form of a pot manifests itself in the mud shaped, shaped by a craftsman. Like the pot, an organism is not a product of a merely random, blind, unguided combination of parts. How can we explain why our eyebrows seem to be designed with the purpose of preventing the sweat or, uh, or of our forehead from falling, falling into our eyes without resort to a designer or a God design or a purpose. Indeed, the incapacity of explaining the spontaneous emergence of higher, not just new, but higher, Forms of movement is the Achilles heel of mechanistic materialism. A comparison of Engels with ancient classical schools uh, that initiated this debate might highlight his position due, due to its denial of a divine design, its recognition of change uh, of chance and the emphasis of mutual interaction, Engels' conception seems to share more with Epicurus than with the Stoics. He thought that chance and necess necessity transform into each other within nature. This means that all regularity that we find in nature have, a, have an history in which an accident transform itself into something necessary. In other words, the regular and the irregular, the simple and the complex are relative principles, constantly transforming into each other. Okay. For, for metaphysical materialism, the rejection of teleolo teleology meant that development, developments in nature such as the evolution of th the thinking brain were a purely aleatory event, were even if a step-by-step -step culturally determinate. Hence, although Engels disagreed with the stoic notion of the 
uh, everlasting resurgence without the smallest variation in its numberless cycles, he is on their side when they claim that mine is not a mere expendable accident within the flow of nature, but an imminent and necessary attribute of nature. This does not mean that the mind has to be present in each part of the world or a, a sort of panpsychism, but that nature as a whole must necessarily produce the mind as at some more or less random point in space and time. But in what precisely does this necessity consist and how uh, the appearance of a new, the emergences of new or more complex forms of organization of matter develop not just as a happy coincidence, but with, with this iron necessity. Dialectical thought found the answer to those questions in the category of interaction. Reciprocal action is the true causal finality of things. And as, uh, and as we have seen with, uh, with our billiard balls or an, our shop at hand, such category only can assume by this dialectical role as internal interaction of a concrete totality. It is true that Hegel's dialectical conception of the concrete universal anticipates this brilliant solution. However, he quickly buried um, or suppressed that uh, idea under his idealism. In Hegel, interaction is seen not mainly as an activity of matter, but as that of objective judgments, purpose, concepts, and syllogism expressed in matter. That's why Ilyenko claims that only dialectical materialism offer, offers a rational explication of the fact that at any given stage of development, any stage of affairs contains within itself, as if we're in Imbro, the objectively determinate and therefore scientifically uh, 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 understandable future. This is how the new and higher form of interaction uh, prevails in time and relatively autonomous process that guides itself into existence. Even if at any time it presupposes lower levels of reality as preconditions in nature uh, that is without any conscious intervention, a newly emerged form of interaction achieves its universality by subordinating the preceding forms as its moments, as subsystems demanded by, um, demanded and therefore reproduced by its particular development. Okay, could you give, give another couple of minutes because we need to have some more time for discussion. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, thank almost you. Almost there, sorry. You okay. Yeah. First, a higher level of development appears as an anomaly, as an exception to the to the rule. How does it become not just a causal isolated event, but a generally universal, a truly universal form? Well, by producing and reproducing its own conditions, integrating and subordinating its uh, constituting its parts um, as a logic of functioning into its own specific logic. That's why um, it is contrary to the electives to reduce the specific logic of development of uh, an existence of a whole uh, to the logic of their components. In conclusion, concrete universality is the form of interactions within and between totalities in historical development. Such a universal character lies not in the abstract identity of similarities among individuals 
put in their concrete genetic link. The goal of such natural processes is posed by itself as the form in which it realizes its concrete universality, its internal and specific laws of interaction that actively produces its conditions as the means of its own development. Here lies the real fact mystified by the teleological conceptions with the phi, they phi, the active principle of universal forms of Plato, the mirror of Arist Aristotle, prime motor, and Hegel's world spirit. And here also lies the fundamental fact unnoticed by inconsistent materialism. But to express a real fact in a mystical fashion is uh, certainly better than simply ignore it. That's why we find more materialism in highly intelligent idealists like Plato, Aristotle, and Hegel than in mechanistic and metaphysical materialism. Okay, that's it. Sorry for taking so long. Uh, I don't know how long it was. But Thank you very much. That was great. Um, very uh, broad and rich as usual. Um, so, yeah, if you could uh, stop sharing, that would be great. And then we'll, we'll take a few questions. And you yeah. can either um, indicate yeah, the question in the chat or. Uh, uh, yeah, I found the button. Okay, so I, could, I think I can now see everyone on screen. So you can either physically put your hands up or um, indicate by the hand up icon. If you click participants on your own Zoom, you should be able to. Um, raise your hand in there. Um, if you can't raise your hand on there, then yes, yeah, uh, put your um, hand up. Is it, uh, any any questions from anyone? I'm just fixing my microphone. Okay, is, is my is my microphone clearer now? Great. Okay, so um, either click participants and raise your hand that way, or um, yeah, do just type it in and then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so Carl, firstly. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say awesome talk. I'm so happy I got to, to catch this because um, I've been thinking about so many of the the problems that you were discussing here. And one thing I wanted to know a little bit more about is I think in a lot of the sorts of things that I read in my own field, um, there's this tendency that I think is closely associated uh, with Western Marxism and the view of nature as being, as you said, kind of this external substrate that gets imprinted with uh, subjective activity. And you used, you know, the word will, uh, like the will and talking about desire and the will as being kind of the principle of activity um, in the objective or in nature. So that, you know, thinking of like existentialist Marxists, for example, where the human project and the human will is the starting point for interaction. Um, that's something I've been like turning over in my head and trying to understand that versus a dialectical materialism. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, how you understand the difference between maybe those two ways of viewing the objective or the, the natural. Should I speak now or I'll wait? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can just answer. Okay, so yeah, that's a really important uh, issue. So I think that I mentioned in my, uh, in my presentation, how the, uh, the role of human labor uh, is taking place here, or the role of the interpretation of human labor. What I think that those uh, Marxists, uh, and I use the quotation uh, uh, Marx, Marxists, um, are getting wrong here is that they uh, only accept they only accept the concept of labor 
or as they call it, praxis, as the only guided directional and therefore active and therefore capable of producing higher forms of existence and therefore historical form of development. So uh, where is the, uh, the point here uh, is that this is not uh, new. That, that's the first thing that I, I, I like to point out. This interpretation is not new. That is basically the same interpretation that you will find in classic uh, objective idealism. So you change the word world spirit and you put the word or the term uh, praxis or historical conditional conditionated agents, social consciousness, whatever, and you get the same formula. It's not new. So what I will say about that is that we must study the classics and see how um, Marx and Engels first um, answer to those classics. And there you will find uh, a way to, uh, let's say, critically read those people like Sartre in critical, um, critical of dialectical reason and so on. So I definitely get your point, um, but that's what I would say. We, we must see this not as a new argument, but something that is quite old, that is taking a new form here. That's, that's for sure. The other thing is that uh, we should find the ideological uh, motivations for this. This is no uh, random uh, position that they are taking. This is the most common, and I will say uh, even typical of Western Marxism positions. This is, this is, in all of them, you can find this. Why? It's not cultural, it's not an accidental thing. So I would say that uh, this is related with a voluntaristic abstract humanist conception of history. So even Marx, I say in his, uh, I think in his critique of the Gotha program, crit he criticized this, he says labor or if you want to put this in uh, Western Marxism uh, terms, praxis is not the sole or unique producer of um, uh, wealth. Um, nature also at the same time. So that's, I think that's the first sentence of, so he already addressed that problem. What I'm saying is that these problems are not new. <laughs> Sorry if I, I took so long, I speak too much. <laughs> no, thank you. So I, I think you partly um, touched on um, a question that Nikos um, would like to ask, but uh, there's still um, far more to say there. So if you would like to uh, unmute yourself, um, that would be great. Uh, so I, I thought the, the comment was uh, enough, but uh, I'll wait. Thank um, you, Rogney, for your uh, talk and uh, it's glad to be back. Um, I was going to ask you something that is always very uh, important for me as a psychologist that, um, you know, in psychology we have a lot of methodological and a lot of uh, epistemological debates about uh, ontology and uh, epistemology and how we're uh, to apply dialectics in uh, things other than human life themselves. So I would like to ask your opinion, and of course, uh, if other colleagues have any other um, remarks to about this issue, uh, isn't it the point of Western Marxism that basically we need to avoid engaging in a dialectical interpretation of mm -hmm. natural processes and focus on the dialectics of social life and social history? And how, how do we reply to such a view? Uh, why do it's important to be consistent in dialectics as an approach to nature itself? Thank you very much. Okay, so I think that the main importance uh, today 
uh, has to do with, first of all, with the ecological uh, crisis and what Marxism attitude must be regarding to that crisis. So um, this is an important deal. If we think of, uh, as, um, if we think of labor as this almost divine activity that can force nature to do whatever uh, man's war without consequences, without um, any, uh, Engels used the word revenge of nature. So nature does his revenge without any uh, response from nature. Because uh, if we took this, um, this Western Marxist view, nature is such a passive uh, realm there to be affected, to be shaped by labor only. So th this is a fundamental view that uh, has um, very, uh, let's say, dangerous um, outcomes if we um, think about of this uh, ecological uh, crisis. Uh, crisis. That, that's the first thing. The only thing, the other thing has to do with our view of society as a self. So my idea is that our view of nature reflects on our view of historical human uh, history as well. Why? Because human uh, history depends on our appropriation of nature. Even from a communist uh, perspective, if we want to build a rational, say, communist society, we must not, not only change the way in which people interact between each other, we also need to change how we interact with nature. And our view of what nature is, is, is fundamental to structure that interaction. So, so that's where I would say that is in, in, in the game here. That's what we could lose. We could lose a proper Marxist um, uh, conception of the relation between man and nature. So I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I hope my uh, connection is okay. It's breaking up slightly. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you can hear me. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I wanted to ask a brief thing. Um, and then it, it, I, I'm not sure if um, then either any or Ralph who, who made comments there uh, want to come in. Um, so, Rockney, I, I wasn't planning to um, bring up Zizek, but you do make um, in your talk that uh, you address the exact thing that Zizek says Ilyenkov um, is doing. So, I did just want to. Um, come back to that briefly. So I agree that um, we um, feel a lack and that's part of our desire. So in a relationship, we feel like um, we lack something another person sort of complements it and certainly is the case for um, homosexual or any other type of relationships. Um, the problem is I'm not sure why there should be a correspondence between our lack, the thing that we feel we lack, and the um, object of our desire. If we say that there is a correspondence that creates a sort of um, correlation that um, is, is a sort of dualism, what I think um, is valuable in what they can points out is um, if we look at a normal relationship, that um, there isn't that balance that um, what I lack in, is fulfilled by the other person and what they lack is fulfilled in me. That sort of uh, yin-yang um, view of relationships, uh, I don't think corresponds. Uh, so in, in order for that to work, that there would need to be something about the form of the object of desire that um, negates the lack that is directing my activity. And I'm not sure that that's the case. So, uh, and that's exactly what um, Zizek later talks about in Sex and the Failed Absolute, uh, why he's critical of the idea of 
um, uh, the idea of uh, there being a unity. Um, so the uh, why he feels ultimately Ilyenkov can't get out of Western Marxism because we can really um, I, 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 I won't overcomplicate it, but we we can't really get out of the sphere of the social if what we're talking about is. Um, a, a lack, like what, 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 does, what could lack mean other than uh, correlating our desire with the real form of something? Thanks. So yeah, in terms of human relations, I think that this dialectic view that you can find in, for example, in the philosophical uh, manuscripts of Marx in Paris, um, in his conception of need, what is a human need and why the first object of a human being is the other human being. I think that that conception has its origins in Feuerbach dialectics. So uh, I really like uh, Feuerbach for this issue. He has this really cool idea of the necessity between the, the, the I, the self, and you, the you, the, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, but there is a relation of presupposition. Oh God, we need each other in order to be ourselves. So that idea uh, is, uh, I will say fundamental because it, it opposes to the common liberal view that we are born into this world with our necessities. We are, we are shaped by, let's say, biology or DNA or whatever. And we have those uh, necessities and we express those necessities with our development as individuals. And then we interact with other people. So this uh, view of Forba is the positive. We don't have such uh, construction prior to uh, interact with people. It's in this interaction with people that we construct ourselves. So we need the other, but why, what is need something? I need something because I don't have that something. That, that's a basic, um, I would say even commonsensical uh, principle. If I need you, it's because you have something that I don't have. Uh, but again, in order to have this relation, we have to share something in common. Uh, the taste of, of a steak doesn't need uh, the square uh, of the rectangle or whatever, because they those objects have nothing to do it, to each other. So we have to share a common, let's say, dimension. Uh, to, in case of human uh, reality, this common relation is historical uh, objects. Let's say uh, something very simple. I think Ilyenkov put the, the example of the spoon. Uh, uh, this is, I, I really like, like that. So the spoon is this common object that we share as humankind. But what happened when I have a spoon of this pen by myself, I don't know how to relate to this object as a human being. I need another human being. I need my, I don't know, my mother to teach me how to use it. So, uh, so this relation between human being and human being is mediated by an object, but my relation with the object is mediated by a, another human being. So it's a double. Uh, uh, so what I mean is that, um, we share a common universe. The universe, in this case, in human history, is the universe of thing created by human people. That's we have, that thing we have in common is the same, but we need the other people because we lack the ability of interacting with it. So in any case, uh, people need each other to be themselves. It's the opposite view of the liberal view of the individual. The individual is himself and then he relates to other people. It's the other way around. So yeah, that's that's my idea. I don't know if Shishek will agree, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that 
it's a very interesting uh, mm -hmm. dialectics. And I will say that we will look, we need to look into Feuerbach and see what is Great. not only the critique that Marx and Engels, they do to Feuerbach, but also what they uh, extract from, the, from him. Very interesting, thank you. Um, and Karina, I think you also wanted to ask a question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Rodney. That was um, uh, brilliant to connect, make those connections with the whole history of philosophy in, in less than in the time you had. <laughs> um, I, I just want to. Um, um, I think it's important to not just talk about interaction um, as a fundamental concept in relation to not just nature, but the di dialectics of nature and of human society and thought that is um, interaction is just one fundamental concept and I think um, really dialectical contradiction is equally important and perhaps more important um, because otherwise it may lead to um, to uh, a two simple idea of progression in nature from the lower to the higher because I, I think especially now in in the 21st century in 2020 at the end of 2020 with the pandemic with the as you wrote said the, the, the encroachment the disastrous relationship between human capitalist society and nature that we have different perspective on this than and Engels could have had uh, he did he did forecast it. in fact in the in the chat um some Paul's put a quote about the revenge of nature that Engels spoke of he did warn about that but um I would say it's important to understand it's not just progression but also regression and disaster destructive negation there can be constructive negation but also destructive negation or and and it's very you know you, there, these um particularly, well, as we know, in human social development, that this is not, in, as you stress, it's not geological, it's not predetermined. It depends on human actions. Um, and, and therefore, I would say, just so I don't want to go on, but this question of Western Marxism, I think, is, is uh, made more complex by this, because um, if it's, contra you know, the Cold War concept, Western Marxism versus Soviet Marxism, is a very misleading and disastrous way of looking at things because, as we know from Ilyenko, Soviet Marxism wasn't, was there a Soviet Marxism, you could ask? Was there even such a thing? Because the establishment Soviet Marxism, I think us Ilyenkovites would not even think of that as Marxism, it was dogma. And they did dogmatize Engels horrendously. He was horrendously dogmatized. And so they, and there were Marxists in the West who didn't go along with that rejection of the dialectics of nature. There were Marxists who didn't reject it. As you rightly said, Lewontin, Stephen Gould, um, in, our, in the movement that I've come from, we never rejected dialectics of nature um, as, a, as part of human mental, psychological, political development. So, you know, the, it's, a, it's an old... Uh, it's a it's a kind of misleading can be a misleading characterization especially because i've just discovered that in fact lukash rejected his earlier position later and so um it's not as we can see it's very com it's quite complex and um i think the the real defect that allowed uh, to answer um um nico uh, who, who oh yeah to answer ian's question in the chat box um uh, about how could this possibly be said about dialectics of nature? How can you deny a dialectic? Um, uh, I think obviously this Stalinization, dogmatization contributed to the ability of people to deny it because it was applied in such a disastrous way. Um, as we know in the terrible effects it had on agriculture um, and so on. So uh, the destruction of the killing of the Soviet scientist Vavilov in jail through starvation. These terrible crimes, you know, allowed this quote Western Marxism to get away with the murder that 
the murdering of Engels, if you like, or the attempt to murder Engels. So sorry if I went on, but um, yeah, the 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 the, the, um, the development of an understanding of this relationship between the the material and the mental and the ideal is is I think the thing we've got to in the twenty first century we need to explore and develop. That's our, got to be our priority as as real Elenkovites, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, well, you you touch a lot of t important topics. Let's talk first about the progress uh, issue. So, um, yeah, the first thing that I like to uh, to point out here is that I think that the Marxist view on this topic is not that every single one historic formation uh, is higher or superior to its precedent. It's not like that. It's not this universal um, zero one law. It's more of kind of a, a tendency, an objective tendency that express itself in history. And you can see that tendency if you address if you look um, long periods of time, you can see that. So uh, that's uh, for the progress issue. Uh, even when you say that, and I agree, and this is a very, I, I would say that this is um, a, a strong point of Marxism, that it's able not only to see the destruction and the negative character of capitalism, but also its productive, positive, um, uh, even um, emancipation character, so, or potentiality. So it has this dual uh, character, capitalism. So um, of course, I agree with that. But even when you say that uh, our modern late capitalist society uh, and can or it is in fact contributing to this uh, catastrophic um, way in which we are right now relating to nature, even that point of view presupposes that it was or it may be in the future a better, a higher, uh, more advanced, more rational form of interacting with nature. It's, it presupposes that there is a paradigm or um, um, a criteria from which you can judge, from which you can valorate, or um, um, yeah, from which you can judge this uh, current, uh, into some extent, irrational form of relation to nature. So the notion of progress from the revolutionary point of view is I would say fundamental. We cannot reject that notion. We cannot make out of out of it, uh, you know, an idol or a, a myth to which we can, I don't know, uh, pray. No, it's not like that. But if we want to construct a better, a better, a uh, more rational form of social interaction, we must address what means to be better, what means to be more rational than, and that involves a notion of progress. So that's, that's the first uh, thing. Regarding the dogmatism in Soviet Marxism, I would say that of course it is. And uh, we, we talked about this in the previous uh, talk that I have with you. There was, and um, Ilyenkov himself was struggling against this. That, that is true. But I would say that it was also dogmatism within Western Marxism. And, and I will repeat what I said about this in the previous talk. Not because you are from the West and not because you are a Marxist that makes you a Western Marxism. I think that this, as you said, this category is complicated. It has his counter examples and have his pros and, and contras. That's, that's true. But it's, uh, I would say this is a very useful uh, category and there are a lot of people 
that made uh, Perry Anderson, um, uh, even a, a, an Italian author, which I'm reading right now, Domenico Losurdo, made an astounding contribution to define what means to be a Western Marxism. So it can be misleading, but only if we we don't have this um, in mind. So yeah, so that's 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 regarding dogmatism. And you, I think you mentioned or you talked about the Lysenko affair, and it's true. Ilyenko also refers to uh, Lysenko. I can't remember. Uh, exactly where I think it was in an article that he wrote entitled Cos Cosmovision and uh, uh, Philosophy. I can't remember exactly where, but he specifically uh, addresses this problem. And the thing about, uh, for example, uh, Lysenko is that, um, you know, this relationship is a very complicated relationship between ideology and science uh, is something that we as Marxists must uh, address without any kind of, uh, let's say, shame. Um, of course, if ideology turns itself into this authoritarian uh, dictator for science, then uh, we, uh, that doesn't work. But the other way around is also true. So we must address the fact that science, as any other human activity, has its political uh, implications and has its political premises. So it is true, but we must uh, uh, find how those um, uh, ideological, let's say, features or aspects of science can be lead uh, in a rational uh, way. I think what that what Ilyenko said about Lysenko was that Lysenko was a great uh, selectionist. That was his theme. But when the state turned Lysenko into a genetist, into something that he wasn't, uh, let's say, um, capable of do, and I, would, I, 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 I don't agree with the, you know, this common thesis that Lysenko was uh, a stupid or ignorant, that wasn't uh, the case. But the case is that when the state turns this guy into, let's say, the authority into, in, in a field that he it wasn't his field, that's a problem. And, uh, and that's, that's a mistake. And that's something that unfortunately uh, happened a lot in socialist countries. Um, Ilyenko himself was a uh, victim of this uh, intromission of ideology in scientific world. And I'm not saying that the uh, scientific is a pure, uh, let's say neutral field, it's not, but you cannot subordinate it to ideology. I will tell you very quick, a personal, uh, experience that I had in Cuba uh, of this um, relation of ideology and science. Uh, I, I won a, a contest. Uh, uh, actually, my, my book was published as a result of that uh, contest. And um, the jury, after in, in the celebration party, of that contest, one of them approached to me and started talking with me and with my wife, and he became relaxed. And, and at some point he told me, you know, you are very lucky. You know why? Because we almost uh, gave the, the, the prize to, an, to another person, not because uh, your, your, your work was inferior or less, uh, I don't know how to say this, or worse than his, because your work was about Marxism. And because in a Marxist country, in a socialist country, it's very hard to assume a position, even if that position is supporting Marxism, because it's dangerous. And yeah, I, I mean, 
And the issue of how uh, ideology interacts with science and vice versa is what is uh, what we are discussing here. Um, and I think that most of socialist countries um, had this problem that they, they didn't they didn't address this correctly. So that's, that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, and last question uh, from Bill. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. That's been uh, very good. And I, uh, it, it triggers lots of things for me, the concrete universal does. And, 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 um, and, but, but I think my concern is just trying to connect it to science. Um, so, so I realise there are debates within Engels scholarship between whether in some way dialectics and the dialectics of nature lays down a priori rules for science in that any form that science takes has got to accord with um, a set of, of, of rules of the, the three of, of uh, our goals, or whether it's after science, a post a yeah, I or I in if that the philosophy of nature, the account changes as new scientific developments occur. Um, and it reflects science in that sort of way. I just wondered if you could say just a bit about the relationship with science which you think that this view has. Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's, that's a very important topic. And I think that Ilyenkov, uh, Ilyenkov's approach to this issue comes from Engels. He, um, Ilyenkov, is um, rescuing an Engels idea that um, the object of philosophy as a science is, is logic. And what does this mean? I know um, some people accuse Ilyenkov of reducing philosophy to gnosiology or, or epistemology um, and as a sort of bad thing that limitates philosophy's interest in science or is, uh, let's say, um, prohibits its um, cosmological content. And Ilyenkov uh, argue against that view and argue, I think, by rescuing Engels' position against this. Engels has a very, I say, cool idea uh, that uh, he wrote in Dialectics of Nature, but also in, in his late uh, works that is called something like the revenge of philosophy. So philosophy, and it takes his, uh, its revenge uh, after its death uh, for being abandoned by natural science. That idea that you can find in the Electives of Nature is what Ilyenko uh, is um, rescuing for establishing the proper relation between science and philosophy. So this relation uh, is uh, what Lenin uh, called an alliance between philosophy and science doesn't mean that philosophy comes first as an a priori scheme. That's what Engels criticized to uh, during. Uh, precisely that, an a priori system that you apply to nature before the empirical, um, uh, let's say, a study of nature. But it's not also the other way around. It's not, it's not a posteriori, um, let's say, generalization of what you discover in empirical um, study of nature. It's not either one nor the other, because the other will mean the transformation of philosophy into, uh, let's say, something that comes after uh, the scientific discoveries, something that is behind science mm -hmm. that comes as I think Hegel that had this phrase of uh, Minerva uh, all uh, that comes uh, um, 
uh, after signs or the the, the night. I, I can't remember the phrase, but you before get the, the idea. Noon. Yeah, uh, you get the idea, right? So yeah. it's not um, the one; it's not the other. What is philosophy? Uh, um, Elienko has a very cool uh, phrase uh, at the very last uh, sentence of his dialectical logic. This is the logic of the construction of the development of, um, uh, of science, of cosmo vision. So it's not this uh, vision of the world as the science of sciences, it's not that. It's the tool that sciences must uh, have to construct that, uh, uh, that worldview uh, uh, as a united system of sciences. So, the idea is not philosophy come before or after. This is a tool that is in the very process of constructing knowledge. Um, uh, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, so, so that's the, 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 the idea that they share. And I think that Ilienko, uh, grasping all these ideas from Engels, goes even further uh, addressing this uh, problem. I think I talked a little bit about this in my previous presentation, where also I sent um, um, the text, the complete article of that pre presentation to historical materialism, the, the journal. Uh, uh, yeah, they sent me back the, the paper, six reviewers went through it, <laughs> and I have to respond. Hopefully, it will be published. If not, I will just post it on academia.edu or whatever. And there I, I, I think that I, I write down my thoughts about that very important problem because either you will find the interpretation of philosophy as a science of science that comes before science, that's the Hegelian view, or you find this positivistic approach to philosophy that comes after science and, and I think that the proper Marxist interpretation that both Hegel, uh, sorry, Engels and Ilyenkov had was neither. So yeah, that's, that's my, my view of, of that issue. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so we are nearly out of time. So I think we'll just sort of um, say thank you again to Rodney and I'll uh, pass back to Karina, uh, although I'm, apologies, I know there were other questions, perhaps we can follow these up at some other time. Thank, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Rodney. Um, I know Ian had a question, but we just want to have a couple of minutes to um, um, just hello, say hello to everybody. And, and if you haven't, if you've switched your screen off and you, you'd like to say hello, feel free to switch it on because various people joined us in the course of the discussion and, and it's, it's really lovely to to see all of you as far as we can see you and know that you're taking part. Um, and you probably missed the beginning when we said hello, happy birthday to um, Engels, which is um, why we're meeting today because it's his birthday tomorrow. Um, I mean, is there, Ian, I, I don't know if you just want to make a comment or just to finish us off and as they say, play us out. <laughs> I don't know that I'm up to that. Um, I was simply going to say the last, well, William's question and then Rogney's answer absolutely struck a chord with me about um, Vygotsky dealing with exactly the same problem about the, is science a priori or not? Um, Vygotsky deals with it and it's uh, the, the essay is called The Historic Meaning of the Crisis in Psychology. And it deals with exactly this in the same terms as it was just answered there. So thanks, that's great. Thank you, Ian. Just um, there's a question from Ralph about logging into the international um, conference, and um, I can send share that with you on the Facebook if that's all right. I share the we've been sent all the login details, or I um, I could send them to the whole email list. Um, it's a bit complicated, but I will try to do that. Um, thank you, Ralph, for that question. Um, yeah, is there anybody else would like to just say hello that is new to our 
discussions, you know, the Povilos, I don't know where you're from, and Sala and Kulos, um, and maybe um, anybody else, Alexander, <laughs> just to say hello. I would like to say a quick, quick thing yes. regarding, regarding the last intervention. Yeah, Bigoski is great. I, I think that one of the, the things that the Western appropriation of Bigoski lacks, especially at the beginning, is this Marxist logic that is behind uh, his theory. Uh, for example, I, I, in Cuba, I, I bought this book that was a translation, this is funny, not directly from Russian, but from a, a, an American um, version of uh, Bigoski's uh, works. And in the, in the prologue, in the foreword, uh, the translator from Russian to English says something like this. Um, we must not consider these philosophical issues here because in science, uh, in, you know, in experimentation, we are all the same. Marx is, uh, I said, what? Uh, I said, this is a, the exact, opposite of what um, I think the correct approach to Bigoski school must be, because they explicitly talk about this. It, it is not uh, a random or an external thing to their theory. I remember when I, when I read uh, Thinking and, 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 and a Speech, I can't remember the, the title of this very important speech and, and thought, well, uh, Bigoski, a critic to Piaget, he said, well, P Piaget denies the, the presence of a philosophical point of view in his theory. He thinks that he's doing empirical research and that's it. Well, what, it, what is actually happening is that a philosophy that he's not aware of is taking control of Vygotsky. And I said, well, this is Engels' view of the revenge of philosophy applied into psychology. So th there it is. So um, uh, yeah, what I, what I think of this is as a philosopher, um, one must read all those uh, psychologists, um, prominent psychologists of the Soviet Union and see what is behind their a specific psychological theories. And I will say that that is that ethical logic is all around there. Um, so yeah, I, I happy that you noticed that. So yeah, I, I shall. Thank you, Rogni. Uh, Penny wants to make a quick point. It's gonna be really quick, Penny. Um, can you do that? You need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. You're muted, Penny. Yeah. That's better. Uh, I just wanted to say on Engels' birthday, uh, as we talk about Ilyenkov and the struggles that he had in the Soviet Union and where we are today, I just wondered if any of you knew the story of the statue from the Ukraine. As you know, Engels has a very special relationship with Manchester. He worked there and, of course, he got much of the material for his condition of the English working class from Manchester. And there was no statue of him in Manchester. And so a British artist went to Ukraine where statues of Bengals were being toppled and uh, put the statue on a big flatbed truck and drove it back to Manchester where the city council allowed them to erect it, but not in a civic space, but in a space which is very precious to a younger generation of Mancunians because it's named in honor of a guy who ran a fantastic nightclub called the Hacienda, uh, which uh, was part of the Manchester music scene of the 1980s. And where the big struggle against uh, the uh, Tory government's attacks on the right to hold loud music parties uh, originated. So Engels now sits in Tony Wilson Square in Manchester, still with the Russian uh, title on the platform, but from having come from the Ukraine, brought by a young British artist. 
And I think that whole story is very much in the spirit of Engels. Yeah, Thanks, I think Tony. that was Phil Collins, right? The one who, who did that? Phil Collins, yeah. Phil yeah. Collins, yeah. I, actually, in the PowerPoint that I, that I used today, the background was uh, that statue that you are talking about. <laughs> Well, we have the honour of having Engels live in London for a long, long time. So we all, we all claim him all over the world. We can claim him as our man.